Welcome to the Energy Solutions Podcast, where we showcase the voices and stories behind a changing energy grid. Stay tuned for a special announcement at the end of this episode. Our guest this episode is Christina Hayes, Executive Director of the Americans for a Clean Energy Grid, a nonprofit consisting of a diverse group from the energy industry, including transmission developers, utilities, renewable developers, and more. One of ASEG's main focuses is to improve the transmission permitting process to bring more capacity to the grid where it's needed most. I'm your host, Todd Snitchler, President and CEO of the Electric Power Supply Association. In this episode, you'll hear what drives ASEG to make change for the reliability, affordability, and sustainability of the future grid. You'll hear an intricate breakdown of why exactly transmission is Christina and her members' number one priority and what other issues she would like policymakers to pay attention to. And you'll hear what Christina sees as the needed approach to the energy trilemma, that is, building a reliable, cost-effective, and clean energy future for Americans. Here's Christina. Christina, thank you very much for taking some time to chat with me today. Uh, We're glad to have you join us. Um, I'm not sure everybody knows about a really well-crafted op-ed that two people put out a couple of weeks ago. So I want to thank you for your help uh, in sharing some views. Where My people pleasure. Can, people may not think we have some commonality, but it turns out we actually do. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of that as we go through our conversation today, but I certainly appreciate your willingness to do that. Absolutely. So, the energy world is small, right? We we indeed. come from a common background, state regulatory, federal regulatory, exactly. a lot of uh, common interests. I think we all want the system to work well. Indeed. And we are going to cover all of that. So before we really get started, can you talk a little about ACEG? And I have to say it because even though it's on your logo up there that people can't see, I always want to make sure I get it right. So the Americans for a Clean Energy Grid, people who aren't familiar with the organization, what is it? What are your objectives and kind of what are the things that you're working on? I appreciate that. So we call it ASEG. Um, Some folks sometimes call it ACAG. I don't know what party they're going to. It must be a little (laughs) different. Um, But ASEG is a 501c3. It is a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Uh, We are a diverse coalition of uh, labor groups, environmental groups, clean energy buyers, uh, renewable developers, transmission developers, utilities, and on and on and on, um, focused on the need for high capacity transmission as the most cost effective and reliable way to decarbonize the grid. So often transmission is the thing that gets left on the cutting room floor. We've seen it time and time again, right? There was the uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, transmission fell out. Oh, next time. Um, when Build Back Better became the Inflation Reduction Act, again, transmission left on the cutting room floor, pushed off to siting and permitting. We're still looking for siting and permitting reform. Right. So um, because transmission is so often the thing that's put off, we are a targeted group that works closely with a lot of other trades in town. So we sure. have utility members who are part of EEI. We uh, work with ACP and ACOR and SIA and so many others who recognize transmission as a really important part of the energy equation that so often is left as an afterthought. Yeah, you you really point to some of the very critical issues that are facing our sector and our our industry more broadly at the moment. Let's take two steps back. Kind of how'd you get into energy and how how'd you get where you are today uh, over the course of your career? I appreciate that question. Um, so I was always interested in um, in public policy, uh, public interest. Um, you know, my dad served in the military. You know, it came from um, a family where that was really important. Mm-hmm. And so um, the idea of serving the public interest uh, was always really important to me. So I literally started paging in the state legislature when I was 12 years old. Like I was always interested in public policy. Um, I've worked in every branch of state and federal government, my state being my home state of Oregon. Right. Um, and energy as a component to that, uh, I came to that um, kind of through that that journey through public policy. Uh, so it was in law school when I started uh, working for the um, Public Utility Commission of Oregon as a law clerk uh, for the ALJs. That was okay. a really interesting experience. Um, I also was in D.C. for the Telco Act of 96, you know, just to completely date myself. <laughs> right. um, but it was interesting to see how these, these um, 
utilities that are intrinsic to everyone's lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really what makes us a first world country, um, how, how strongly they're impacted uh, by public policy and how it intersects with industry. And so working through, and, and then I kept running into energy sort of on accident. Right. Uh, when I was in law school, I spent time working for a Ninth Circuit judge who had been a public utility commissioner. I clerked for a judge in the Oregon Court of Appeals. My our whole my whole interview revolved around the HOPE standard. Like who else wow. nerds out about the HOPE standard, yeah. right? Um, and so from there, I went to the, I was an ALJ at the Oregon Public Utility Commission. And that was a fascinating experience, mm -hmm. really focused on the public interest. And at that time, uh, the local utility, Portland General Electric, was owned by Enron. And went through. Everybody's got an Enron connection. Every oh, time we go through this right? exercise, everyone has an Enron <laughs> connection. It's it's everywhere. Um, so so there was the Enron piece um, when uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy acquired mm -hmm. uh, Pacific Core. Um, I was around for that. That was a fascinating experience. And so just seeing how utility and utility regulation intersected with everyone's lives, right? So mm -hmm. energy is only 5% of GDP, but is the first 5%. Mm -hmm. um, from the Oregon Public Utility Commission, I went to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission for nearly a decade. Uh, I worked uh, on the 11th floor for Chairman mm -hmm. Wellinghoff. That was a fascinating experience. I was with a law firm. I made it about 15 minutes, I think, and decided <laughs> that that was my billing time was up. Right. My billing increment was quite over. And yeah. then I went to uh, the parent company. Um, I went to work for Berkshire Hathaway mm -hmm. Energy for about seven years. Um, parent company of Pacific Core, NV Energy, and Mid-American as the mm -hmm. vice president of federal regulatory affairs. And so working on rulemakings, um, making sure that folks in the states knew what was happening in D.C. and making sure that folks in D.C. understood the impacts of their of their policies yeah. uh, in the states. And, you know, especially when you get those calls, there's a big storm coming and, you know, a big heat wave. And we're worried about being able to keep the lights on, right. you know, so many, so many, you know, resource issues and, you know, just really interesting things. Um, from that side. Um, and the transmission was a huge part of the equation. There's a huge amount of um, focus on transmission development and really what it means um, for making sure that the grid is ready for what comes next. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Berkshire Hathaway Energy, Berkshire Hathaway really has a long view. As you can imagine, when, you know, the the person who heads up your company is in his 90s, yeah. you tend to take the long view, right? Yep. <laughs> um you know, because you're thinking about it for generations. And that's really a great perspective to have on what energy means to the mm -hmm. vitality of the country. And so from there to leading ASEG, um, which has really been a treat. I've built up the team. I was the first uh, steady employee. Right. Um, so open up an office. I'm about three blocks from FERC, three blocks from the United States Senate. And uh, we've built up the teams where we have a legislative guru, a regulatory guru, and I'm learning communications like this podcast, so important, right. um, and and really enjoying working with um, all the different uh, parts of DC, inside DC and also outside DC yeah. on on the evolution of of the energy industry. Yeah, I know you've been in and out because I've seen you in both places uh, doing work and various panels and programs. So uh, I can certainly. Uh, commend you for the amount of miles that you're putting on while we all try to solve some of these problems. And I think your really deep experience, and I mean that as, as sincerely as one can, you have a broad and deep background in the energy space. Your perspective about the energy trilemma is perhaps better informed than most, given the experience that you've had both the state and the federal level. So the push and pull that exists between reliability and cost and sustainability or environmental goals, put whatever label on you want to put on. How are you looking at that in your current role, given your significant background? And really, you come from a different part of the country where hydro is a thing and environmental goals are a thing. And then you come to other parts of the country where those issues just aren't the same, but you've seen kind of the full depth and breadth of what's, what's facing us. So I'm really interested in your perspective about the energy trilemma because you, you really bring a fulsome view to it. I appreciate that question. Nothing in the energy industry happens quickly, right? That's for sure. Um, 
<laughs> this is the Titanic. We're trying to make sure that we don't sink it, right? We're <laughs> right. trying to keep this afloat. Yeah. Um, and part of that means that, you know, taking all of the factors into uh, consideration as decisions are made without expecting any um, rapid uh, changes in one direction or another. Um, part of the challenge is you can you can set yourself up for um, analysis paralysis, yeah. right? You know, let's make sure that we have all three pieces balanced at all times, and then you end up doing nothing, yeah. um, which is really unfortunate. You know, and we've seen that. Um, I think about uh, transmission development after Order One Thousand, right? I always mm -hmm. insist that was meant to be iterative. There were, you know, it was you know, in right. energy policy, things are constantly changing, and mistakes are being made, and you need to you know take another look. Um, you know, are we doing things right? Do we need to make adjustments? And you know, a lot of uh, transmission build out after Order One Thousand and really got sort of frozen in place. Mm -hmm. And that's not right. Um, we need to, you know, shake the snow globe. We need to, you know, take another look, figure out, you know, take another crack at um, rebalancing those three factors, as you said, um, because not doing anything is not an option, right? Yeah. The rest of the world is not standing still and it will only get worse if we give up trying to balance the pieces. But that's honestly why we support the build out of high capacity transmission. That's the best way really to balance, to think about how to, um, to, accommodate as many different needs on the system as possible at once, rather than um, one of my favorite terms is spaghettification, you know, building a transmission line right. to every single resource. And that's the most expensive way to do things. Mm -hmm. So really kind of taking a step back, trying to um, take an honest assessment of what's coming around uh, the corner and iterating um, you know, on a uh, on regular intervals rather than getting frozen in place. You know, right. come up with a transmission plan, build it. Okay, now do it again. Um, right. MISO is doing that really well, where they, you know, built out what 10, 12 years ago, and then they started running out of capacity. Well, let's do it again. As mm -hmm. opposed to in Texas, where they did a great job of it 12 years ago, and then they forgot to do it again. So, you know, they're starting to run into capacity problems. So I think I know, based on your last answer, where you may be headed with this, but I'm curious what you view as the most significant challenge or opportunity to solving the energy transition. You know, that's a term I don't really care for. I like energy expansion because I think we're going to need more and we're going to need to be able to move it, as you said, to where it's going to be needed. But if we're going to have reliable, cost-effective and clean energy that's deliverable across the country, I think I know at least one of your answers will be, but wh what do you think are the biggest hurdles or opportunities that we've got to address? <laughs> well, I think I think you've guessed already, and I think we use all the same words. I mean, I agree with you in yeah. terms of an energy expansion and uh, evolution, and you know, and resources do change. You know how yeah. you know we have a lot of we have a lot of older resources on the system that you know are aging out and need to um, be repowered or redeployed or replaced. I mean, there are a lot of different um, a lot of different things that are happening on the system. It's a very large country, right? Yeah. There are a lot of things that need to happen on the system. Okay, so if I'm not allowed to say transmission, which is of course the answer, um, right. it's um, getting everybody else to think about transmission as the answer. How about that? Um, so thinking about it from the state perspective, for instance, you know, you we both come from uh, O State. States, right. Sure. You know, from from the state commission yep. perspective, you know, if you're looking at an integrated resource plan and you're looking at the generation mix, you're only looking at part of the solution. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're trying to keep costs down for one piece, you're not looking at the overall the overall picture. And so thinking about co-optimizing, coming up with mm -hmm. the best um, system of looking at transmission costs with generation costs, the best combination, providing um, geographic diversity, resource diversity, mm -hmm. um, that kind of reliability and resilience that gets built into the system. If you're not relying on one particular kind of thing from one particular right. place. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm a little bit jealous, to be honest, you know, with Ohio having, you know, robust access to both PJM and MISO at the time, right? Or is it now only PJM only it's now? only PJM now. It was both historically. Oh, see, you had it made where you had access to, you know, a, most of the Eastern interconnect and all of the resources that are available. Right. Um, and, you know, having that, you know, wide variety of resources um, really provides a kind of reliability and resilience and access to the lowest cost resources that are out there. You know, let's bring more things on the system wherever, you know, wherever they right. might be. And so building out the wires to access low cost generation really is where we need to be going.
I thought you might have included permitting and citing as some of the things that are oh, good. That to be addressed. <laughs> so. Well, and citing and permitting is perfect to bring up today because, as we know, there is legislation currently pending right. in Congress. And we have been told pretty much since it passed the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee several months ago that no further thought was going to be given to that bill until the lame duck session began after the election. So right. this a little bit, you know, with the election being held today, it's a little bit of like a starting gun. Everybody's poised and ready, ready right. to take on. What may actually happen? Wouldn't it be great to finally have something happen, right? So this is a holdover from 2022. Right. And you could tell, so Senators uh, Manchin and Barrasso really developed this, you know, with their staffs together. And um, they really kept a pretty close hold on it. And Yes, they did. Right? <laughs> and in 2022, they came out with a product and you can see that they really listened. They took a lot of feedback. Mm -hmm. um, but then in 2024, they they have come out with their bill. And yeah, I'm waiting to see what happens next. The other issue, aside from permitting and citing, of course, that's on everyone's mind is rising demand. We had a whole conference about co-location on Friday at FERC, uh, last Friday, as we're recording this. Um, and you're seeing virtually every part of the country at some level of an increase in rising demand. Uh, we haven't seen that really anywhere in 20 years, probably, maybe even a little longer. Um, do you think we're going to be able to get the power that we need on the system, as well as move it from where it will be generated to where it needs to be? Or are you troubled by the difficulties we have with building big things right now, because the, the challenge before us is pretty sizable and it's going to require a lot of moving parts to all happen simultaneously. I'm curious your perspective, because you're sort of the delivery vehicle for some of the electrons that are produced to ultimately where they need to be utilized. I think to be an energy policy, you have to be an optimist and take the long view. So I'm going to say, of course, we're going to solve it, Todd. <laughs> that Hathaway thing, this. really, that like it's stuck. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, so I've been thinking about this a little since this might be like the third call about this subject today, sure. um, and I'm sure everyone's in the same boat. It's it's requiring us to use muscles that we haven't had to use in quite yeah. some time, That's and a great so. Way to say it. Um, you know, we haven't had to build big in quite a while between energy efficiency and, you know, not needing a lot of new demand for quite a while, you know, sending things overseas. Yeah. We haven't needed to build a lot of new things quickly in quite a while, um, which is unfortunate. So a lot of lessons that we had learned before, like there is one grid, right? We all do better. It's, it yeah. is the most cost effective thing cost-effective system when we are all on the same grid. When you have two grids, that gets more expensive, that gets more difficult. And we saw that a little bit in the FERC order that came out mm -hmm. 15 minutes after the co-location <laughs> tech conference ended. Right. And so I think there are some short-term solutions. I think there are um, a lot of solutions out there. And we need to do a lot of work to get there is to build out the transmission and the generation more robustly to meet mm -hmm. the need. And that's going to require much better load forecasting mm -hmm. um, at the the regional transmission position. You know, right now it's being done through load serving entities mm -hmm. and utilities, which is, you know, I completely understand that, you know, those are their customers. And, you know, when I worked for the parent company of NV Energy, you know, their biggest load were casinos. Casinos were right. great load, yep. uh, but data farms are on such a much bigger scale. And it's difficult to, where you look at utilities having to double their footprint overnight practically, that is really, really hard to do. And so working with load serving entities, but also looking at a bigger level, at the regional level, I think is um, going to make it easier to, to put the pieces together, to be able to digest this really, really large um, load these large load requests that are out there. So I'm really hopeful that we can do that better through regional transmission planning, through um, larger generation procurement. I'll, I'll detour here just a minute. Sure. Um, we took a we took a family trip over spring break. We were in a third world country. Um, I had always wanted to hike Machu Picchu. Uh, we had had a great time, um, but uh, but because I can never turn off the transmission piece. Um, we're driving through kind of their equivalent of Yellowstone, this huge mm -hmm. national park, and I asked the local guide we had, you know, these big, beautiful transmission lines. What do you think of those? And she was like, well, we hate them. Oh, you know, it ruins the landscape or, you know, you know, the natural wildlife. And she was like, no, 
the large companies put them up, but they bypass the communities. Uh, We're still getting a couple hours of power a day from diesel generators. We would love to be able to access that energy. She'd grown up in the area and, you know, 20 years earlier when she'd been a child, you know, she used to bathe in the hot springs. Like they didn't yeah. have running water. They didn't have, they didn't get electricity until she was 18. Wow. And so this idea that um, we would build out two grids and bypass a community, that's third world stuff. And yeah. we're better than that. That's, that's an interesting perspective, something we don't always appreciate because we're, we're kind of spoiled because as I like to say, and it's I, every podcast, I say this, I think people want three things, lights on, beer, cold, water, warm. And in America, <laughs> that generally happens. I mean, with yeah. very rare exceptions, we, we find that that's the case and we want that to continue to be the case. That's what reliability is all about. That's making sure we have appropriate resource adequacy, all the things that you and I've been talking about. As you look at transmission, I mean, what needs to be done in order for us to get a better handle on that co-optimization, to actually see the utilization and deployment of the resources from your perspective, which are, of course, the wires from our perspective, it's the generating resources. But what are the roadblocks? What's keeping you from getting where you need to be? Is it purely federal legislation? I suspect that it's not that easy, but I'm kind of curious what your laundry list of, you know, if I could solve these two or three things, it would go a long way towards addressing the challenges that we're experiencing on transmission build out. Uh, well, we always point to the the three biggest obstacles being related to planning, permitting, and paying. So I'm, I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm going to talk like about it. permitting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so honestly, we would love to have parity with pipelines for how transmissions permitted. Um, so having multi-state lines or lines of a certain size, certain capacity being subject to sort of one and done, one-stop mm -hmm. shopping um, at FERC. And FERC is very good at setting out the rules. Um, you know, FERC gets a lot of grief, you know, oh, they rubber stamp pipelines. Like, no, no, that's because they have pre-selected and pre-established right. the rules. There is so much vetting and work that happens before an application yeah. even drops at FERC. And so, you know, let's set up the rules. Let's make them very clear, very specific, and developers would love to know what they are right. so they could meet them and then have a, um, and, and DOE has set a bit of this up with their uh, 216H authority. You know, let's have a one-year pre-application process. Let's have two years from application to record of decision. I would like to add, we should have one year from record of decision to notice to proceed you know, you're right. talking about those 18 year lines. A lot of those are yeah. out West where it took 10 years to get a record decision and another seven or eight years to get a notice to proceed. And in part, that's because you have six years of um, judicial review um, mm -hmm. on NEPA. Yeah. And so I appreciate and I appreciate the concern for those who feel like um, they want to make sure that they're not getting overrun, uh, that they people have sufficient notice and opportunity yep. to comment and to relocate the line and to make sure that they're using the best possible technology to have the least impact on the land. Those are all really valid. Um, but take but making sure that you don't have federal and then state and then local obstacles uh, obstacles to every transmission line. Um, but it doesn't all have to be done through federal legislation. Mm -hmm. um, Nevada does it really well. Where Nevada is something like, what, 90% uh, federal lands? Right. So they decided not to have a whole separate state process, but instead to participate in and make the most of the federal process. And so you don't have that consecutive. Mm -hmm. You have, uh, was it contemporaneous or uh, concurrent. But, yeah. Concurrent, yeah. exactly, where they yeah. work together. And so you minimize the uh, burden on state resources. They have a great BLM director in Nevada where they say, instead of going through every single field office, we're going to do this one time through the state office where right. you have long linear infrastructure. That's not meant, you know, the, the rules about, you know, citing a particular facility within a particular BLM yeah. field office, right, is not well suited to transmission. And so- you know, consolidating some of those efforts to make sure it's robust and done one time. That would be really helpful. Right. The other piece that's really helpful in the siting and permitting bill is uh, cost allocation, just because cost allocation is so challenging. Um, I'm sure that's no surprise. Well, I'm curious if you think that that state, federal, local, and private enterprise model can be replicated in other jurisdictions. Did you did it work because of the unique situation that exists 
in Nevada for that example, or is that a model that ought to be copied in other jurisdictions because it did function in a way that actually enabled you to get from here to a decision, let's get moving on things? Are, are there are there things that you say, yeah, that, that actually does make sense. We should be replicating this in other jurisdictions? Because I think that's half the battle is we found something that works. Now, how do we transfer it to other places so they don't have to reinvent the wheel themselves? Oh, I absolutely think that is a model that could and should be replicated. Okay. Um, another idea is, um, again, with DOE having set up that uh, 216H, the CITAP, uh, citing and permitting system right. where they um, want to be sort of the um, single point of accountability for citing and permitting in the, at the federal level, much like FERC is for pipelines. They yeah. really want to engage states. And I think, honestly, that would be great because not only would you have um, the states the states working together under 216H or 216I, um, but then also then the states who know how much they need the power for their own economic development and their own, you know, ability to provide value to their constituents. Um, they can hold the Fed's feet to the fire as well. And right. I think that's equally important. Talk to me a little bit about how the public engagement piece needs to fit into that state, local, federal, private enterprise piece, because clearly the public wants to be involved. They do not want to be steamrolled back to your example a moment ago. Um, but what's the? How do you go about doing that? What are your thoughts about making sure that we keep the public informed in order to successfully achieve the needed infrastructure build out? Because it is significant. And how do we get communities to be encouraged to participate and be supportive? Or what do we need to do differently that's been done in the past? Because we have plenty of examples where that didn't work. So what's the how to make it work formula? I'm glad you asked. I was actually at a at a conference. You'd be so surprised. Oh, um, and uh, it was uh, a collaboration between NASIO, NARUC, NGO. Okay. I'm sure I'm forgetting some other things that start with N. Um, but but really coming together and and talking about how to develop energy infrastructure in order to make sure that they have adequate resources, yeah. let alone meet their their policy goals. Um, but in a way that brings their constituents along. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really, it, first of all, it's incumbent on the developer um, to make sure that they engage with the communities. It, it, at the very least, it's good business practice because it mitigates litigation right. risk on the back end. And, and same that's true with, for generators as well. I mean, we're in the exact same boat as you on this. Absolutely. It's one of those, was it a, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound yes. of cure? Yes, exactly right. right. And then certainly, um, you know, state agencies, elected officials, you know, they do not love angry constituents on their doorstep by Correct. any means. You've been that guy, right? Yes. That is not <laughs> the phone call that you want to get. No, no, not from your governor's office, not right. from your neighbor, no, none of this. And so yeah. um, they really, they're, they did a good job of looking at a spectrum of levels of participation. One is, do you not tell them at all? Is there a postcard you get in the mail? Yeah. You know, do you hold a town hall and provide more information? Do you take input and respond to that? And there's really a spectrum that goes all the way to communities deciding that they yeah. want to host infrastructure. Yep. I'll be honest, like having come from... The developer side, I'm not really sure how that works because I know so many of the decisions that developers have to make in terms of economically designing a system and citing infrastructure, that's kind of tough to leave that to communities, right? That's an expertise issue. Right. Um, but there are a lot of places along that uh, along that spectrum. Um, and yeah. so engaging communities early and often. So one of the things that ASEG has done, we put together a, a roundtable table. Um, with DNV as uh, the consultant and, you know, brought together uh, members from the tribal community, environmental justice, environmental labor, developers. I am sure I'm forgetting somebody. Sure. Um, but the idea of, you know, bringing a number of folks together and say, OK, yeah. what practices work for everybody? Yeah. You know, something that it's not it's not such a burdensome cost that it makes energy projects infeasible because yep. that's a non-starter. Right. Um, you know, everybody, like you said, wants to keep the lights on. But also, how do we have robust enough outreach and collaboration so yeah. that we minimize litigation and are able to effectively build infrastructure? You know, honestly, one of the biggest things that sounds so minor, but is looking at payments over time, like an mm -hmm. annuity rather than an yeah. upfront payment, making sure that communities and landowners continue to be bought into the value of this resource 
over time, not as one and done. And I've talked to developers where they say, you know, they've they've engaged, they've gotten eminent domain rights, and then they keep going on with their project and they get a call from the landowner and they're like, no, no, we're bought in now. <laughs> like, right. we're your partner now. You better yeah. tell us how it's going. We want to know. Right. I think that's probably a best case scenario, right? To have somebody that's positively yes. engaged as opposed to the opposite. So Absolutely. We've kind of danced around it. So I'll just ask you directly, what's your vision for a clean, reliable, cost-effective energy grid? Pick your time horizon. People like to say 2030. That's like tomorrow in our world. So I'm not sure if that's the right timeline or not. But what are the milestones to get from here to there? As you look at it and say, you know, I think it's going to be X period of time for us to do it. But these are the things we need to see in order to actually get there from here and deliver the system that I think all of us agree we are trying to achieve. It begins with planning and building the infrastructure that's needed to deliver the resources for economic development, for, you know, maintaining our lives and our lifestyles. And, you know, in first world country that we're lucky enough to live in, especially today, election day. Um, And so looking at. Uh, and, and we have some good sort of signposts as to what that looks like, right? There was the SEAM study about a decade ago that the labs put together where they said, if you if you built some high capacity lines and it would require then significant integration, mm-hmm. right? This is not like you you put out, a you put the Audubon on right. the system and you're done. No, you actually have to like build the secondary lines and the service roads and you have to, the off ramps and all of sure. that. You have to integrate it. Um, I think that has evolved over time. We saw the DOE came out with a study last month. There's always a study last month, right? right. Um, where they talked about sort of their base case, um, what the AC build out would look like, what point to point would look like, and then something called multi-terminal. And I'm not even sure really what that is yet. It's a mesh interregional. It's sort of like the holy grail system. Okay. So, so they're able to show what benefits yield from the costs invested and it gets to be pretty significant it's more than a buck 50 per dollar invested mm-hmm. so it really is worth it to take a step back look at how to not just plan the bigger system but also how to operate it in a way that's more efficient so that also involves looking at some of the market mechanisms right so what does that look like we have the doe uh, study out there what does that look like um FERC recently issued its order 1920 requiring regional rules uh, requiring regional planning um, for transmission it could be uh, regions under 1920 using the doe study as a gut check as a you know sort of a way to check their homework sure. um cliff notes um you know if they start looking at if regions start looking at interregional planning maybe using that as a guide um or you know as a way to corroborate um mm-hmm. planning that that takes place um we do have to get beyond the level of planning we have had for the last decade 15 years like it this is not where we are now is not okay in terms of our rate of build and we've heard we've seen some really great projects um be proposed uh pjm um there's the aep dominion first energy um proposal that came right. together so so joint ventures are really exciting um so i think there's the possibility that industry is going to meet the moment, you know, see what's required to meet it and step up. Um, I think government's been providing some good uh, kind of fillers where needed. You know, the transmission facilitation program provided Mm -hmm. um, some funding for various interconnection um, lines, interregional lines um, between uh, planning regions. And so I think those are really exciting. Um, But if industry doesn't um, meet the moment, then I think government is going to have to do more and more because, as you noted, the large load issue isn't just a commercial issue. It's a national security issue. The government has an interest in the national security of the grid. I mean, I right. could talk about like, you know, building out the big interstate highway system for the grid, um, you know, Interstate 5 to Interstate 95, all of that is obviously very heavily federally regulated. That's Mm -hmm. not the grid we have today. I know um, it would take a lot for us to get from where we are today to that kind of a system for the grid. Um, I have have hope and I have faith in uh, so much of the industry is 
focused on the public interest um, as, you know, and as, as we experience through our roles um, with state commissions, the public mm-hmm. interest really does just rise to the top of so much of what you do in the energy industry um, that uh, I have hope we can get there. Yeah, your analogy makes me think, where where does that put our members? I mean, we're, I think we're in effect the auto manufacturers who are building the electrons that have to get onto that highway system and move. And the highway system's great, but if you don't have anything to put on it, what do you have? I mean, so we've got to make yep. sure we're marrying. And I think that's what you and I tried to talk about is how we co-optimize some of these things to get where we want to be. And one of the issues that I think we both tried to stress in the op-ed that we did together was the need to kind of rise above some of the partisan bickering. I know that's kind of yes. the things we do here in Washington more often than not, but we're trying to find that common ground that makes sure that we can achieve the outcome that I think all policymakers deep down really want. That's what we as industry really want. And that's frankly what the consumers expect. So yes, do you think we're, as I sometimes say, I'm I'm becoming more optimistic that we're at the reality check moment where people are going to have to realize that all this sounded great when it was academic, but it's a reality now. So we're going to have to think harder about really getting to solutions. Do you share that optimism or are you optimistic in a different way. I, I kind of used the terrible, since we're doing all these analogies, you know, we're going to have to break a couple eggs to make an omelet. And the omelet is a highly functional power system from generation to delivery mm-hmm. to utilization. That's probably going to mean that some things are going to get prioritized differently than some of us would like, depending on where we sit on the value chain. But I'm curious if you think we can get past the partisan bickering and get to a point where we realize and implement the solutions that'll be necessary to deliver the grid that we want going forward. I mean, it's not 1950 anymore. We're moving towards 2050. What's that grid actually got to look like? Yeah, the hard part is, is that I think our biggest obstacles aren't it, aren't necessarily partisan related. Um, we, we frankly we have bigger problems than that, <laughs> right? There's so there's so many challenges in terms of just financially and the sure. affordability issues, and you know what people can take. Um, we were talking earlier about um, you know running into a mutual energy colleague. Um, I r- ran into at the grocery store on yeah. Saturday, and we we're talking about the election and and. And inflation. And I was looking at, you know, the rotisserie chicken in my basket that used to be $5.99 yeah. and now it's $9.99. And, yeah. and yeah, you know, I can afford the price of t- chicken that's doubled, but, you know, for groceries to have gone up that much, that really has a huge it's impact a real thing. on a family. Yeah. Oh, it is. And I'm feeding teenage boys. Um, yeah. So, so looking at the cost, right? So, so much of our, of our transmission grid is aging, and needs to be replaced. Well, what are we replacing it with? Um, so much of our uh, generation uh, fleet is, you know, aging out and no longer suits our needs, and that's being replaced. And uh, supply chain issues became a real thing during COVID, and especially with these horrible storms that we keep having, and certain mm-hmm. parts of the country having to rebuild, functionally rebuild their grid on over, a semi regular basis. Yeah, over and over, exactly, and inflation. And I, I mean, like, and in interest rates and the cost of debt. And I mean, like so many. And so honestly, by the time we get to the partisan bickering, that's almost like the least of our worries, <laughs> because what you said, we want the same thing for everyone. We want right. something that's cost effective, affordable, reliable, and moves in. It's moving into the now. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, being prepared for what comes next. And so, um, you know, appreciating that. um Okay, well, um, since since we're using all our bad metaphors, let me bring out, bring out another yeah. one. Uh, as a Sunday school teacher, right? And so there's the parable of uh, the man who takes a tour of heaven and hell. So the man goes to hell, there's the long table, it's piled high with food. People have little T-Rex arms and these long spoons mm-hmm. and they're starving and they're hungry and they're angry because they can't feed themselves and go to heaven. Long table, piled high with food, little arms, long spoons, and they're happy and smiling and satiated because they can feed each other. The long spoons are the transmission lines. We really need this <laughs> to feed each other. We need yeah. we need this in order. And so the idea that um, my resources can be exported to 
meet somebody else's energy need, especially in times of storms, that's that's right and appropriate. It's also right and appropriate that if my resources are being exported, that I should be compensated for that. And so I think there are a lot of uh, parts of the country that feel kind of abused and put mm -hmm. upon that, you know, what do you mean that I have to bear the burden of all of this infrastructure to meet right. somebody else's energy needs? You know, that's that it's part of the bargain of us being one country. Um, and again, having that incredible standard of living and and standard for economic development. So um so thinking about cost allocation, thinking about, you know, putting together the whole system um in a way that meets all those needs is really important. Uh and is probably one of the most difficult issues to navigate. So we will continue to work on how we solve that issue. So I have Three lightning round questions that I'm going to ask you. You have to give short answers. So are we still going to be talking about gas, electric, and transmission reform in another dozen years? Hopefully there will be a new version of it. Hopefully we will not be having the same fight, but some sort of new and improved discussion. That would be- Do you a think? Welcome, that would be a welcome change. Um, what do you think energy legislation will be focused on 20 years from now? I'm excited to see what new technologies it will implicate. Yeah. Um, you know, we'll have some sort of new generate, new form of generation, new form of transmission. We have new wires, new technologies all the time. I'm excited to see what sort of new services that's going to bring to customers, to people. Yeah. Okay. Last one. What's your best golf story? Oh, did I never tell you I met my husband on the golf course? No, that's a great story. <laughs> that worked out well. It did. It did. Even worse, I beat him. Wow. <laughs> Just that one time. He's beat me every time <laughs> since. But but yeah, in that first hole, I stuck it to about six feet from 180 yards. And uh, I've been duffing it ever since. Oh, How about you? What's your best golf that's story? Terrific. I don't have a great golf story. It's a work in oh, process. No. It's always a work in process. <laughs> so my, my best golf story is that I got to volunteer at the U.S. Open this year, and we were working on the 18th hole when Bryson and Rory came down 18, and so the shot out of the bunker was – I was holding the crowd back for a hot second, and then he made the shot, and the crowd was like the Red Sea coming together. So, yeah, that's my best story. That's a great story. Yeah. So, Christina, I can't thank you enough for taking time to visit with us today. Uh, certainly, there is a lot of interplay between generation and transmission. There's a lot of commonality about the issues that we face, and we're always happy to find partners who are willing to find that common ground and work together. You've been exceptionally helpful in trying to find those avenues, and we are certainly appreciative of your work in this area. Thank you, Todd. It's always a pleasure to see you. Thanks for listening to Energy Solutions. For more from Christina Hayes, check out our joint op-ed on Utility Dive, linked in the show notes. If you like this episode, please share it on social media with your coworkers, friends, and family. You can also connect with us on X, at EPSA News, on LinkedIn, and on threads, at Electric Power Supply. We also have a monthly newsletter where you can get updates on policy priorities, what's moving power markets, and the latest innovations from competitive power suppliers delivered right to your inbox. And subscribe, follow, leave a rating or comment on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Pandora, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And before you go, I want to announce that registration for our fourth annual Competitive Power Summit is officially open. The event will take place on April 2nd, 2025 in Washington, D.C. See the show notes for more information and registration. Solutions is brought to you by the Electric Power Supply Association. EPSA represents America's competitive power suppliers, which bring about 150,000 megawatts of power generation resources to customers throughout the United States. The music in this episode is written, produced, and performed by Let Me Hold That LTD. Discover the power of competition at www.epsa.org.